All right. Well, I think we're going to get going. It's uh, just a few minutes after the top of the hour. We have close to 60 people or so on the line. We have about 150 registered for today, so we'll probably pick up a few more as we get going. But um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for joining today's uh, webinar with more Community Investment Johnson. Um, and we're real excited to have you and Jane Arsenault um, with us today. So. Before we get going, just want to give you a little bit of background for those of you that have not participated in a virtual uh, leadership series or any of the other webinar offerings that we've had this year. But Ford Community Investments has been around for almost 20 years. Um, we are a community development financial institution providing access to capital and providing advisory services and education to nonprofits across the state of Wisconsin. We do an annual um, nonprofit economic impact survey. And each year we take a poll of the nonprofits across the state to really take a look at um, how well those uh, how well those nonprofits and the sector as a whole are really performing, and what we try and do is uh, look at trends and things that are coming out of that nonprofit economic impact report to drive our programming for the following year. And so we're real excited with today's offering around collaboration and having Jane with us, as this is one of the things that we heard in last year's um, survey that nonprofits are really um, talking more about and and in some cases struggling with and trying to get going and, and have a better understanding. So. Um, there's the challenge between uh, uh, having fewer resources and greater demands for services and without the support of BMO Harris Bank and really underwriting this leadership series, um, we wouldn't be able to provide this, this learning. Um, Harris Bank and M&I came together to form BMO Harris uh, about a year or so ago. Um, BMO Harris is an active partner in Wisconsin communities and demonstrates strong corporate citizenship, citizenship as an important part of whom they are and how they approach communities. So, we thank BMO Harris Bank for their support to provide building financial sustainability, the virtual leadership series across Wisconsin's nonprofit community. A couple of things we want to do before we get going with Jane this morning. Um, we want to just make sure everybody has an understanding of the technology that is um, being utilized for today's offering. So we have a few things um, to go through. On the screen right now, you should be able to see the GoToWebinar dial-in information. If you are not dialing in from your computer that you're actually using a landline, that's the number and the access code that you would need. Uh, to listen in. If you are using your computer, you're probably already hearing me. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, we want to make the webinar as interactive as possible, and we'll be taking some questions during the webinar. Um, you can submit them either using the chat feature or using the questions box on the right-hand side of the screen. We're also going to be doing um, some polling today. Uh, we'd like to, everyone to participate in the first poll, which is really asking you, you know, who is here and what's your role with us? And so. The first poll should be up on your screen right now is what's your role? Are you an executive director? Are you a board member? Do you represent staff? Oftentimes we have some funders on the line. Um, or if you don't fit into one of those, please feel free to click the other box as well. But we want to get a general sense of who is with us today. Um, so that's one way to get a good sense of who's here and also for you to take a chance at uh, playing with the polls. The other thing is that we want to use the chat feature. Um, so using your chat feature, again, is on the right-hand side of your screen. If you'd enter your name and the organization that you represent today, we'd love to see who's on the line and um, know who's joining us as well. Great. So I am starting to see them coming through now. We have a good representation across the state. Um, it also looks like we have... Uh, the majority of the folks on the line today are split between staff and executive directors. So about 38% are staff, 36% executive directors, 20% board members. We have folks on the line today, uh, at least at this time, and 7% others. So it gives us a good cross-section of, of who is, is with us today. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, today's topic is collaboration, and then presented by Jane Arsenault, who is the principal of CEO Partners. I'm just going to give a little bit of background of Jane before I turn the call over to her. And we are going to have a dialogue today. So some of our webinars um, in the past have been more kind of presentation. We really want to make this um, as interactive as possible to get your questions asked and answered. And I'm going to be interacting with Jane uh, in regards to the, what we're seeing with the clients that we're working with around some collaboratives. But a little bit about Jane. Jane Arsenault, um, Principal of Field Partners, has worked in the nonprofit sector since 1977. Her practice includes strategic planning, market studies, research, and extensive work on collaborative models. As her interest in collaborative work intensified, she became more and more involved in the creation of strategic alliances in the sector, 
leading eventually to the publication of Forging Nonprofit Alliances, which was published by Josie Bass in 1998. This was the first book ever published on consolidation in the nonprofit sector, and it's been used as a textbook across the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Over the last 15 years, Jane has facilitated many mergers, affiliated organizations in both parent corporations and management service models, and developed service networks in multiple industries. She's worked with various United Ways on community impact strategy models since 2011, and recognized as one of the 40 most influential and top industry performers by Folio 40. At this time, I'd like to turn the call and the presentation over to Jane. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dennis. It's lovely to be here with you all. I'm very excited about uh, talking to so many nonprofit professionals and board members in Wisconsin. I'm here in Rhode Island and uh, want to share with you the um, well, some of my experiences in terms of building this these models. Are you able to see my screen at this point, Dennis? We are not seeing your screen yet. Okay. And so we should have. There should, should be a. We, ah, are we there? I think we are getting there. Okay. Once you click yes that you're taking it, then I think it, we will be seeing your screen. Are we there yet? We are not there yet. I'm still seeing the. Here's what. Uh, maybe we. Now it's now. There. We are there now. So hopefully everybody can. If you can't see Jane's screen, please uh, throw us a, a message in the chat feature. Um, All right. We okay. Uh, it looks like it popped back. So if you're getting the yes box, click yes that you're accepting. Yeah. Is, can you see me move the slide? No, we're not seeing. We're only seeing the white background screen right now. So I think what we'll do is we'll pull the deck up on our end just so we can keep moving here. That's fine. And I'll just tell you when to move the screen. Yeah, that would be great. So I think Tom's pulling that up right now, and we should be floating through. Uh, yep. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. <laughs> Technology, isn't it wonderful? Thank you, so, um, we're going to do another poll, I understand. Dennis, do you want to take them through these? Yeah, the, um, you know, the first slide is really kind of the topics for today's session. Um, there were a couple of three different kind of key co components that we were hoping to uh, present and have a discussion around today. One was to discuss the collaborative models available to nonprofit organizations and how nonprofits are using those models to create competitive advantage. Um, the second one to review how to identify opportunities to use those models. And then the third one, which I think is really key and really um, the component that we tend to hear most often is how did to begin, how do you, how did organizations begin to explore the factors of a collaborative process? So we do have a poll um, that we wanted to engage everyone with first, which is really kind of asking what's your experience um, in, in working with others? And so the poll should be opening up on the screen shortly here. Um, and there you go. So the options are we've coordinated our efforts with one or more organizations. We've had at least one formal agreement. We've led a formal collaboration, excuse me. Or we currently are in some type of merger uh, process. And so if you take a few minutes there, we're starting to see the, the numbers come in. Looks like the majority is we've coordinated efforts with one, excuse me, one or more organization at this point. Um, we have about 70% of the folks on the line that have completed the poll. Uh, about half have had at least one formal agreement. About 25% have had at least uh, or led a major collaboration. And the minority, not all that surprising, is that they're currently or have been participated in a, a merger before. So. Overwhelming, 84% is that we've coordinated efforts with one or more organizations. So I don't know how that um, lends to your, your experience across uh, the country, if it's similar or dissimilar, but about 80% have, have coordinated efforts but not perhaps participated in a formal agreement or been part of a major collaborative before. 
Well, I think that does reflect what's happening in the sector. For the most part, we're seeing organizations coordinate with each other, uh, some sort of sign formal agreements. But the merger activity, we're seeing more organizations actually go bankrupt and go out of business than we are merging. And that, to me, is very sad. Um, we have this sort of horror of merger, but it actually can be a very useful tool in terms of saving organizations and the tacit knowledge and their knowledge of community and their, their particular expertise from sort of leaving the sector. But let's kind of turn our attention a little bit to the environment for nonprofits, um, because one of the things I want participants to understand, particularly those board members who are with us today, is that the environment for nonprofits has it, it isn't just changed, it's transformed. Whether we're talking about funding cuts or service redesign undertaken by state governments, reductions in eligibility, certainly rising demand due to the incredible economic dislocation that we've been through since 2008. Um, we see falling reimbursements. Um, there was a, a I, I attended a, a recent um, discussion where the impoverishment, it was called the impoverishment of government. Um, and we, we cannot expect this to turn around, for the most part, in terms of state and municipal government. They will continue to struggle. We have changing social norms, one of which is this sort of era of scarcity mentality. But the other thing is, is just the incredible change from positive to negative when we look at uh, attitudes towards dependent populations. This notion somehow that if you need help, that you're a taker rather than a giver is really pernicious when it comes to the funding of human services. So we're seeing changes in social policy, some of which are undoing things that we thought we had settled 50 years ago, certainly changes in government roles and, and a redefinition of what government thinks it should be doing, and, and quite frankly, a lot of mistrust of the sector. And so I um, want to go to the next slide. I think what we have to recognize, first of all, is the degree of disruption. And um, in the nonprofit world, when we have disrupted uh, markets, what we have to understand is that it requires very different behavior to then managing in a stable environment. And it's, and it's really important that, that executive leadership and senior leadership in organizations and boards really understand the impact of what's happening on your industry on your competitors, and on your own organization. Next. So we've got another poll for you, and that's to get some insight into what coping strategies you've used to kind of deal with the economic downturn so far. Dennis, you want to take them through? Sure, yeah. So coping strategies here, we've got a couple different here that I think tie closely into the environment that James is talking about in regards to what's, um, what's happening out there. But um, strategies that organizations that we work with oftentimes either are they reducing their budget, are they cutting staff wages or hours in some way, or reducing benefits. Um, in some cases, it might be closing programs um, or increasing eligibility requirements. Um, one that shows up in our economic impact survey, we track you know what kind of reserves are in place um, across the sector, across the state of Wisconsin, and really, um, I think this last one here is is what we predominantly see is you know, organizations have spent down reserves. They tried to hunker down. They've tried to um, you know, use reserves to get, help them get through. And oftentimes, those reserves are now been depleted. And so what we're seeing here is about 40% have reduced their budgets, and about 30% have spent down their reserves. So um, kind of right-sizing the organization being one, and the other one spending down their reserves um, being kind of the number two. So I don't know how that compares with what you're seeing um, in other parts of the country, Jane. Well, it kind of depends on uh, where you look. If you're talking about state-funded programs, particularly on the East Coast, you, you, we would see probably that 7% be a lot higher. We've had an enormous number of organizations need to really cut staff wages and benefits, reduce hours, go from 40 hours to 35, cut salaries 30%. Um, it, the impacts here on the, on the East Coast have really been significant in terms of staff wages, particularly in mental health services and services to the developmentally disabled. They've been particularly targeted, I think, by several East Coast states. Um, no particular explanation that I know of for that, other than, that, and other than they are residentially based in very expensive systems. Um, so that may be part of it. So let's go back and um, 
kind of talk about kind of the difference that this kind of environment makes on interagency uh, cooperation. So go to that slide with my little green bubbles. There we go. So when we have an abundant environment, what we all kind of float around near each other. We don't really have to have a lot of things to do with each other. We don't have to we don't have to work together. Nobody's going to make us. Next one. When we have scarcity and stress and duress in our environment, we tend to actually separate more. There's a kind of bunker mentality that that uh, occurs, and we, uh, in fact, um, hunker down basically uh, and separate. Next. And then we start to just, some of us start to disappear. Uh, we're particularly concerned out here with the loss of some agencies that serve minority communities who seem particularly vulnerable in this environment. And, and we have a lot of shrinkage. And clearly, those that large percentage of, of listeners who cut budgets reflect that. Go ahead. Next. Yeah. But what we want to understand is that when we sort of seek seeking stability and competitive advantage in order to survive in adverse climates, that one of the best things that we can do is to build platforms of connected entities that help to calm the environment down. And that we can, in fact, by building different sets of relationships within the sector, make these platforms more competitive and more attractive for funding. And that's really what we're about today. Go ahead. Meg Wheatley is one of my favorite authors, and I know it's one of Dennis's as well. And there's a wonderful book she's written called Turning to One Another, Simple Conversations to Restore Hope to the Future. And what she says is that it's absolutely true that in any living system there are predators and prey, death and destruction. But competition among individuals and species is not the dominant way life works. It's always cooperation that increases over time in a living system. Life becomes stronger and more capable through systems of collaboration and partnering and not through competition. And I think that's kind of the value we should have with each other as we look at how to get through um, this, this really difficult time. Go ahead. And Jane, do you have reflections there on, you know, I think, you know, when I see the word competition, oftentimes um, we, we as a sector don't even like to think about competition because we work in such a collaborative way. And so I think sometimes, um, you know, organizations are needing to become more competitive today because there are scarcer resources and greater demands for services. And so are you seeing any trends or any anecdotes around, um, you know, I, I fully appreciate Meg's work um, and, and the point of this particular um, kind of quote, but, you know, are you seeing any particular trends around organizations needing to be more competitive? Um, and where does that fit into that collaborative space? Well, I think the, where I see organizations needing, more com, needing to be more competitive is around measurement of outcomes. Um, and I, I think there really is a, a very strong push to, to integrate evidence into our practices. Um, but we're also seeing organizations pushed, particularly by United Ways and more and more in the community foundation movement, to think about collective impact, to think about how we relate to each other and how our individual outcomes add up to change for the community. So it's a real mixed bag. On, on, one, on the one hand, there's less money, and we're fighting for that less money, and we are, in some sense, competing against each other. And on the other hand, there are really strong pushes to say that that competition is not that healthy, and that what we really should be doing is thinking about the connections between and among the various bodies of work that we undertake, and how can we get maximum impact and real community change. It's really how do we fix the underlying problems? How do we work to do that and to do that together? Yeah, and I don't know if it's different here than what you see elsewhere, but oftentimes I think when we ask um, you know, leaders and board members and you know, kind of pull the sector around you know, what, what level of collaboration is occurring, oftentimes what we hear is we're collaborating and really what I wonder or suspect is that oftentimes it's coordinating. How are we coordinating efforts? How are we coordinating services versus really collaborating? So um, well, maybe that gets into the next slide. Yeah. Let's, let's, so let's, let's recognize that what we're talking about from 
cooperation to consolidation is a continuum. It starts over there on the left-hand side with coordination. Collaboration, I think, is kind of in the middle. And then over on the right-hand side is consolidation, where we're really fundamentally changing legal agreements between and among organizations. Um, and those, these are really different categories of behavior, and we need to capture them in different ways. So that second line talks about the fact that when we're coordinating, for the most part, we're making verbal agreements with other organizations. We might have a brief MOU that you know, writes down what we're agreeing to, um, all the way over to merger agreements on the right-hand side. And there's a whole array of, of different kinds of agreements that capture this activity. Uh, and what we have to understand is that when we're moving from left to right, we're increasing central authority and we're reducing the individual autonomy of the partners that are engaged in this work. Go ahead. So let's just do a little comparison here. So under coordination, chances are we're exchanging information, we're avoiding duplication of efforts, we might be orchestrating efforts, trying to look at how things fit together. We're doing some cross-referral is really common sort of coordination activity. And we might be supporting one another's advocacy efforts. You know, we've got a bill at the State House, and will you sign on? Um, will you write a support letter? Collaboration, on the other hand, the com we're, we're getting down to, to really organizing work differently. And the complexity of that work is likely to be greater. The number and kinds of organizations involved may be greater and wider. Um, the magnitude of purpose kind of rises in significance. And the number of levels that have to be coordinated increases. So for instance, we might easily come to agreement among CEOs about how to manage a joint grant proposal. Um, but you also have to engage middle management um, as well, potentially, the direct service employees if you're actually going to deliver that collaborative grant pro proposal together. So when we get to collaboration, again, we have this kind of increase in complexity. Next. In terms of consolidation, now we're getting quite serious. We're altering the legal links between organizations. There are significant increases in complexity. And part of that complexity comes from managing higher risk in these kinds of agreements, um, both liability and financial risks. And we don't do these kinds of things, altering legal links between organizations, unless we intend to do this for a while. Um, you don't alter legal links between organizations for six months. We're really talking about things that have longer duration that we expect to last through time. Go ahead. I'm just going to jump in here, Jane. We got a couple of um, comments. I'm not sure that they're actually questions, but um, I posed the question. You know, is the organ is your organization needing to be more competitive or collaborative, and why? And a couple of things that we're seeing here is, you know, um, some challenge around. Is it about more competition? Um, collaborate collaborations are tough when you have reduced staff. You've got reduced funding cuts. Um, how do you get out? How do you meet? Um, may is oftentimes the challenge is what we're seeing here, and so. Um, the other comment is, you know, in collaboratives, if you live in a smaller community where resources are really scarce, how do you um, try and collaboratively work together? And so um, not sure they're questions, but they're certainly comments and um, uh, something that maybe we want to uh, think about. Uh, yeah, I, I think some of our examples in a few minutes will might be helpful to those folks. So let's, let's see if we can't get there. All right. Um, so strategic alliances really operate not in the coordination space so much, but in the collaboration to consolidation space. Um, one of the things that I, if you come away with not, no other lesson from today's discussion, it's really that structure should not be assumed, and you have to match it to the complexity of the work. Okay? It grows organically from the work itself. And that you're not going to do this unless the purpose is significant enough to be worth the process of design. As somebody just pointed out, however do you find the time to do this? Um, collaboration takes time. And so we have to make sure that whatever time we spend on it, the, that the purpose for which we're doing it is sufficiently compelling that we don't question its worth. Um, so we, we use this effort to do important things. And, and I would suggest to you that the most important things that you should be doing 
are ways to either sustain or improve quality of service to consumers. Um, so it really ends up being on behalf of and to benefit your clients. Go ahead. So how do we create alliance opportunities? Well, the first thing we do is we learn what others are doing. Um, uh, I'm going to talk you through a bunch of examples. Um, there's a, a great website that the Foundation Center has that there's a database of different collaborative activities of people who of the applications for the collaboration pl uh, prize through the Lodestar Foundation. Um, you can spend some time looking at, at what other folks are doing there. But I also suggest that you need to look internally, and we'll talk in a minute about what that looks like. Go ahead. So when we think about alliances, we start down there at the bottom in terms of joint ventures and partnerships, then management service organizations, service and other types of networks, a parent corporation, and mergers or acquisitions. And when we go up and down this scale, what we realize is that the lowest risk and the lowest cost to create options are at the bottom of that triangle, and the highest risk and the highest cost to create options are at the top. The other thing that happens is you have a shift in corporate control where you're really giving up some corporate control kind of right at that midline just above service networks. So when we're talking about loss of autonomy, there are ways to create all of these structures so that you do not lose in autonomy entirely, but instead balance it. And the art of creating them and designing them is about creating a balance so that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish. You can get the work done and you have enough structure and authority to do it, but you don't lose any more autonomy than you absolutely have to. Next. So let's talk about some examples of joint ventures and, um, and partnerships. These are the simplest agreements, but we still have to write them down and we still have to have them reviewed by an attorney. And we use them around knowledge sharing, market access, new product or program development. So that first model up there simply has one nonprofit, what I call NPO3, contracting with a couple of others. Um, and it, it's just an interagency agreement, um, but it needs to be, in terms of, of significance, for example, um, three chamber music groups here in Rhode Island, uh, all of whom were struggling, decided that it was time to really understand the whole market for chamber music in Providence, Rhode Island. So they began to combine their mailing lists and make agreements about that. They developed a sampler ticket, and um, they, you know, essentially worked together to do audience development, um, which is, in another instance, um, we had a couple of organizations work together, one of whom provided services to the disabled, another provided services to the brain injured. They came together in a joint venture model that um, essentially created a, a brand new program, and that program was designed to bring uh, vocational services to veterans who were returning with post-traumatic stress. So it was a very interesting, strong joint venture. Um, number three is really about, um, which is kind of a partnership model, that's number two. Number three is, is um, an example would be a, a, a parent-focused program that is launched attached to an elementary school. The idea was to bring a, create a child opportunity zone and bring organizations together uh, to bri provide services on site. What they discovered pretty quickly was that just having the people there really didn't get the audience to that site. They ended up um, really capturing that child opportunity zone as a, as a joint venture, as a separate corporation with its own staff, with its own outreach staff so that the joint venture ended up doing the outreach and bringing the parents in by working with guidance counselors and teachers and so on to identify at-risk kids and at-risk families. And then the different nonprofits provided services on site. So that was a, just a really nice and successful joint venture. Next. Management service organizations help us in a bunch of ways. 
They can reduce costs by consolidating overhead, that we have to be a little bit careful in that um, right now you've all cut your budget so much and thinned out your infrastructure that we don't save as much money as we used to. Um, large organizations, though, uh, can still save quite a lot of money by by integrating their back offices, and I'm, what, I, what I mean by large organizations are organizations that you know have more than five or six million dollars of annual revenue. Little organizations struggle with this, um, but third-party negotiations or joint purchasing um, can be accomplished through MSOs, contract management, submitting grants jointly. Um, all that uh, we can uh, pull together. Um, HR services, financial services, physical plant services, pull them out and capture them in one of two ways. So the first way is actually to incorporate the MSO, create a board, um, affiliate all the um, nonprofits that are to be served um, by, by giving them board representation, um, and then aggregating all the management staff that are currently in those nonprofits into this little pink box that's box that says MSO staff. And so what you've done is you've created a single finance office that's going to serve multiple organizations, a single HR office, a single quality assurance office. I'm doing this now in the city of Providence with a whole range of youth serving and child serving organizations that are all single program agencies and very tiny with very little infrastructure. And what we're hoping to do is to create um, something called Community Links Providence um, which will essentially provide kind of that management infrastructure underneath all of these small organizations, all of whom are struggling to hang on to the tiny bit of infrastructure they have. In so doing, what we've discovered is that um, there are a lot of problems in this area that people are paying much more for management services than they, than they should. Even things like bookkeeping are far more expensive than, than they should be, than, than their actual cost. So we're also hoping to use this to sort of drive down costs. For the, if there are any large organizations out there in the audience, think about this. Um, most large organizations have particularly IT uh, capability that is actually of more capacity than they need. Um, most financial management systems, for instance, even if it's just um, kind of the bigger, more uh, expensive versions of QuickBooks can um, keep books for multiple organizations, multiple corporations. So model two really tells us that um, you, you can have a large organization that simply re reaches out to small organizations um, and to, uh, to provide that kind of support. And, and, and as we go through this difficult time, I certainly urge my large clients, of which I have several at this point, um, and get them really thinking about this, about how they can help the small organizations um, in their region or in their industry or in their that organizations that are in reasonable geographic reach, how can they can use their existing infrastructure to support them? Go ahead. And we've got networks. Um, networks are, I think, the newest kid on the block. Uh, when I wrote my book in 1998, I didn't write about networks um, because they really weren't there. Um, networks are can be about sort of sharing a single source contract with the state. So here in Rhode Island, um, it, the discussion about networks really began when we recognized that child welfare services uh, needed to change and that we had snatched far too many children from their birth families, were keeping them far too long in group homes or residential facilities, and that the research was telling us that we were doing really untold damage to their lives by operating in the that way, and that we really needed to create much more robust community-based services. So networks, originally the idea was that we should um, create uh, networks of community-based services that are holistic, that include community action agencies, that include workforce development, um, that include anti-poverty efforts, um, and that we need to surround families with, with a holistic set of services. In order to do that, the state went from 61 contracts with 61 separate pro providers to two contracts, um, creating two fairly significantly sized networks to do this integration work. 
Unfortunately, they did that just as in the economic downturn, and our legislature decided that this was a great opportunity to cut budgets. Um, and so uh, the networks, which were originally designed to, for service redesign, have now become a cost control mechanism. But nevertheless, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting model uh, in terms of building service continuum to control the flow of referrals. So for instance, here we have um, a very interesting network that's emerged around uh, services to the elderly and disabled that starts at the very beginning of the continuum in terms of home care. Um, they have adult day health models and day services to support families trying to deal with dependent members all the way through assisted living and nursing homes. And they've created a very interesting kind of stream of connecting that continuum of services. We can also use a network to coordinate services in a region. Um, there's an organization called the Warwick 13 here in Rhode Island. It's the 13 most common social service agencies. And those of you who are in small committee communities kind of look around. This, this, is, not a, this is not a big city. This is a small city. Um, and uh, you know, Warwick only has a couple hundred thousand people in it. But they have these 13 agencies. And it's the Mental Health Center, and it's the Domestic Violence Agency, and it's the Boys and Girls Club, and the YMCA, the CAP Agency, and so on down the line. It's the 13 most common agencies you're going to find really in any American city. Um, and what they discovered was that they have about, we did an analysis and discovered they had about 2,000 clients in common. The other thing we saw was that 70% of their effort was going into getting people out of crisis and that what we needed to do was change that. And so over the last two years, they've done intensive work as a network around really improving their case management services and their service integration across this group of agencies to try to take people from crisis and move them to a point of, of productivity and contribution rather than simply they realize that of those 2,000 people, at least half of them simply went from crisis to crisis to crisis. So the other thing they did is they also recognized that in those 1,000 people, what we saw was that group of people tended to have trauma history. So they've done, in, they are in now in the process of doing intensive training around motivational interviewing and, um, and trauma-informed care with people that work at the Y, with people that work at the boys' club. So it's just a very interesting, very different model of intervention across multiple service arenas. Um, a, and Jamie, Jamie, I have yeah. a question coming in that I think um, fits in now for th for this um, what you're talking about here. The question is, how do each of those agencies maintain their autonomy, and how is the lead agency decided? I think the question is in regards to the Warwick 13 that you were just talking about. Well, they, the interesting thing about the Warwick 13 is that the, they take turns. Um, they, they have had a total now of six different grants to fund this effort. And three of the organizations have been financial lead agencies on each of the grants. Um, and um, they, this, this is a shared power model. It's not about anybody sort of taking control and pushing the others around. Um, there's no change in court control here. All of these agencies still are completely independent, have independent budgets, independent IT, independent everything. Um, but th this is really about building very real but, and virtual, and it, it's about relationships. It's about, you know, we meet as CEOs, they meet as senior managers, they meet as middle managers across some key programs, and by doing this training together, they're trying to build relationships at that direct service level. So this is really about creating a uh, kind of web of relationships and positive network around this these 2,000 families with multiple needs. It's hmm. not about changes in control at all. There's no loss of autonomy. Great. Thank you. OK, so next one. So now, we're, now we've shifted a bit. Um, these are, we're talking about parent corporations. These are phase mergers often. Uh, we use them when we need very powerful service integration. Uh, and it's well, we can also create kind of interesting financial stability strategies for large related entities. 
Uh, for instance, right now I'm working with four mental health centers and that, are, that would form a statewide network. Um, essentially what's happened is that our two largest mental health uh, organizations have affiliated with hospital systems here in the state, which of course makes them very expensive because it drives up their um, overhead costs. So the, the four remaining smaller entities are now coming together under a parent. Um, that parent will be able to essentially help them compete for business. So again, this is about sustainability. This is about you know being competitive in this different world we're in. Um, and so what they're building is there on the right-hand side. It's kind of a flattish model. It's not as hierarchical as the one on the left. And um, it will have a foundation that's attached to it that will raise money for all four. It will have an MSO, a management service organization, that will integrate back off the services over time. Um, there will eventually be what we call an IP trust, which is a, a trust that protects the intellectual product of the various affiliates. And the most important piece of this is that middle piece, as they create essentially a CEO who is going to manage the business development um, for the, in this case, this three in this picture, but four in reality. Um, it's a, uh, the boards have come together, and again, we needed to uh, kind of negotiate this out at multiple levels. So the boards have designed the governance structure uh, on which all three, well, four uh, entities will participate on that board with combined board members. Um, we've negotiated out how the operations will run in terms of the relationship between the CEO of the parent and the CEO of the members. And uh, eventually, we will move to the next level of figuring out how to integrate their financial systems, how to integrate their HR, and so on. Um, on the left-hand side, these tend to be more hierarchical. So your basic hospital system looks like this. Um, I, I don't find that this is a particularly uh, attractive model to most of the groups of agencies that I work with. That one on the right, though, has real merit. It allows organizations to be what we call global, G-L-O-C-A-L. That means global and local at the same time. Um, big and small. You can be big when you want to be big and compete as a big entity. And at the same time, it doesn't undermine your ability to be small and to uh, fit into your local environment and maintain those local relationships with donors, with your network of local agencies, and so on. So it's a... Uh, this is, I think, one of the most powerful solution sets we have in those industries um, like services to the developmentally disabled and mental health, um, that this is one of the more powerful solutions in terms of reorganizing systems um, that can really help to arbitrate this very changed environment. Next. And then we have acquisitions and mergers. Um, and, uh, Clearly, we can simply push them all together and make one larger nonprofit um, that's just a bigger version of one of them. Or we can, on the right, has never is a new need. Uh, for instance, in our child welfare system, um, we can um, where we where we have this real push away from residential care. You can, at one point, we took three organizations. They each had residential programming. They each had community-based programming. Their community-based programming, in no case among the three, was enough to actually be an agency, didn't throw off enough overhead to support them. By putting them together, we were able to create one agency focused on building out community-based services that was much better positioned to the environment that was demanding that. So we can get rid of excess capacity, create economies of scale, reduce competition, reduce duplication of effort, and invent organizations that pre previously weren't needed. Um, mergers are a useful tool. Um, they are high risk. They are expensive to create. And we should not be using them unless it's absolutely necessary. Next. 
And yet, Jane, let me just um, uh, Anna, jump in there. You know, oftentimes we hear funders say things like, oh, there's X number of nonprofits in our community. If we only had half as many and that they, those half were more impactful, um, I think sometimes there's a misnomer that, like, mergers are going to create um, some financial efficiency. And from our experience and what we're reading and seeing and um, hearing is that that's not always, um, you know, coming to, to fruition when a merger actually occurs. Well, I would agree. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should be, I don't think, I don't think we should be doing mergers to bring about efficiency, because I don't think they're efficient. <laughs> I really don't. Um, I think there's got to be some other really important driving reason to do this, uh, and and that may be because one organization is not viable, but there's some piece of it that we really want to save. Um, it may be that uh, you know some big chunk of services are disappearing, like residential services for children. Um, I mean, there may be real reasons to do it, but I think we have to be clear about what those are. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. Let's, let's go to that poll. The next All right. Slide. So we have another poll coming up that, that kind of now asks you what type of collaborations you've been part of. We've heard a few or a couple of the different types of models, but um, you know, have you been a part of a joint venture? Have you participated either providing services as an MSO or have you contracted perhaps with a, man with a management service organization? Have you been part of a network or a parent corporation or a merger? Um, so we've got, what do we have? We have about 25% responding so far and it's split pretty, a third, a third, a third almost between joint ventures, networks, and mergers. Um, Looks like networks is is building, you know, similar to what you were talking about earlier when you wrote your book. Uh, networks wasn't really even on the landscape, and yet here we're seeing the majority of the folks that are responding to the poll today have been a participant in the network before. So, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, good. Okay, well, let's keep going because we don't want to run out of time here. Yep, we got about 15 minutes left, so. Okay, we should be all right. So. So we can look at what other people are doing and how they're using these models, and we can also kind of look internally. Next one. Go ahead. Keep going. Just keep hitting the button. There we go. All right. So what we have here is kind of a model for strategic management in a nonprofit organization. Clearly, we've got to be clear about our vision and our mission and our values. Task two is about the core of our organization organization, which is made of programmatic strategy and relational strategy. So on the programmatic strategy side, do we really have the resources to deliver what we want in terms of our program goals and our outcomes? If we're missing some key resources, if we don't think we can do it, if we see a need in, in the community that we can't quite figure out how to get our hands around ourselves, can we find a partner to help us do that? So when veterans started to return with post-traumatic stress, the disability agency saw it was a problem. The one that's focused on brain problems saw it was a problem, but they couldn't really meet that need unless they worked together. So to me, those are the greatest win-wins, is when the community actually gets something more or something better out of this activity. On the relational side, we'll, I'm talking one second about systems participation. But fund development, can you work together on responding to an RFP? Um, are you better positioned if you're working with others? Um, can you work together around outreach, around educating people? Can you bring people together um, if you feel like you've got some group of people that are underserved in your community? Uh, and, and do joint outreach to them, educating those people about a range of services, like my Warwick 13 folks. All those kinds of, so really looking internally, really asking yourself the hard questions about how well are we doing this? Where are the gaps? Where are the problems? What can we not do? And, and using those gaps to really sort of drive your thinking about the kinds of partners you should look for. And then there on the right-hand side in terms of task three, financial management, information management, HR, risk management, physical plan. Those are our key supports and safeguards for every organization needs those to some degree. So if you're large and you have excess capacity around this, how can you contract with others? How can you help smaller entities? If you're small and struggling, 
and you know there are five other small and struggling agencies that can't do these things well, then try getting together to talk about how you might do that together. So go to the next slide. So I want to just take one, one second just to talk about systems participation. And that is particularly those gold boxes along the bottom. The people you compete with for consumers who provide the same or similar services. Those to whom you refer for allied services. Those to whom agencies who refer consumers to your programs for allied services. These are your natural relationships to partner with. So each one of you should have a map. And this is something you can even talk about with your board or even construct with your board at a retreat or at a longer meeting. Really say, like, who's in our universe? Who are we? do we already have relationships with? Your collaborative partners are probably people you know already. The vast number of, of relationships that I've facilitated along that entire spectrum, people are known to each other. This collaborative work is not different than fundraising. It passes across relationships. Um, it, it's very difficult to make it happen with people that you don't know. So think hard about who you, who's in your network. Go ahead. So sources of relationship. Two executive directors or friends or respected colleagues who see value in building an organizational relationship. Program staff are working on a common project, and they see the potential for deeper integration. There's an outside entity. It asks the group to convene and solve a problem. What I didn't tell you before was that the Warwick 13 was actually convened by the mayor of Warwick, um, who said, I need your help because I'm not going to have any money, and I know there are going to be a lot of people in trouble through this recession. So would you please try to arrange to do your business differently? A funder puts out an RFP that requires collaboration to contract. There's general recognition on the part of some industry leaders that they'll be more competitive by working together. That's the leadership piece that cannot be understated in this work. There's economics to be considered. There's cost seat savings as a means of enhancing survival. You want to accomplish something bigger than you can do on your own. So there's a desire for joint programming with another entity. Or it's a crisis. There's an urgent need to salvage programs or staff due to financial losses. So even if you just take those bullet points and you say, how many of those apply to us? Those are your opportunities to build these relationships. Go ahead. So let's get ready. All right. Go ahead. So how do we start? First of all, make sure your internal stakeholders, your board and your staff, really understand the environmental factors that are influencing you. And also, you need to kind of do an inventory of your own internal strengths and weaknesses and figure out what's driving you to seek alliances to begin with. Some people say, well, should we have alliances even though we don't need them? The answer to that would be no. Um, as I said earlier, these processes are sufficiently complex and annoying and, and time consuming and expensive that I think you want to make sure that the purpose of that that uh, for which you are undertaking this effort is worth it. So really understanding what it is your organization is trying to accomplish by seeking this collaborative work. Go ahead. One of the things that we have to think about when we're doing this work is who is going to do the negotiating and what is the role of executive leadership. Um, this is a very worthy thing to have a policy about. Um, in terms of an agreement between the board and particularly the executive director about what's going to happen. When the collaboration um, activity speeds up in your area, it is highly likely that your board, one of your board members is going to go to a cocktail party and somebody's going to walk up to them and say something like, our, orga our organization should merge. And then you might say, uh, then that person could get into a longer conversation, and these two board members are all the way down the road figuring out um, how that merger might happen or how to start those discussions. Well, what you really want to have happen is to have any overtures, whether they are made to the executive director or board members, about this collaborative work to come back inside the agency so that you have the opportunity to sort of compare that opportunity 
against your internal objectives and make sure that pursuing that particular relationship or opportunity is fits with your own concepts about what you should be doing. Um, as you state those internal objectives and you identify opportunities, you need to be really clear about the possible forms that an alliance might take. I'm sure you have all noticed in your roles as, as executive staff that boards do not like surprises. So getting on the road thinking that you're doing some one of those more lighter weight collaborative activities and then discovering that you're actually in merger discussions is a really bad idea. So again, be clear about the possible forms, be clear about your objectives, and how those two things fit together. Go ahead. So we want to educate stakeholders, um, inside and outside. You have to figure out the degree of support from people like your funders, um, as well as your internal stakeholders, your board and your staff. Now, does that mean that you have to have perfect unanimity before you proceed? No. It's very normal for boards to be very nervous about this activity. Um, we think about this. You ask your board to be a board, what, 25, maybe 30 hours a year? For the most part, the decisions you ask them to make are very uh, either incremental or they're very repetitive. They're cyclical. We make the same kinds of choices year in and year out month in and month out, we approve our financial statements, we accept the executive director's report, um, we approve a policy for this or for that. We don't ask boards to make big left turn, right turns, changes in corporate control kinds of, of um, decisions. And so when, particularly when your board might be involved in needing to approve what's going to happen, we have to do a real, we have to do a lot of work to make sure that they're educated and comfortable and feel confident that, in fact, they can make these choices. Go ahead. Next slide. These things cost money. Now, the foundation community has been wonderful. They probably pay for 85 to 90 percent of the work I do in this space. Um, but you still need to determine how much money you're going to have available to contribute to the cost of professional counsel. Chances are that this will cost something. We need to determine an internal negotiating team or an individual for the less kind of serious and complex models like joint ventures, it might be simply done by the CEO. As, we, as I pointed out as we kind of went up that uh, triangle, the more complex models require more multi-level kinds of negotiating teams. And we need protocols for internal and external communication about this opportunity. One of the things you want to do is control rumors um, so that your staff don't think you're, you know, just because you've opened discussions to talk about it being part of the network that, in fact, you're thinking about merger. So being really careful about um, about confidentiality, if you need to maintain confidentiality, or about other kinds of, of um, very careful, very careful communication. Because this can, we do not want this to become something that's destructive for your organization. Go ahead. So a typical decision model might look like this. We could, would appoint a design team. We would create a rationale, which would be jointly with the other, other organization or organizations about what it is we're all trying to accomplish together. There might be some social exchanges at the board level. You could tour one, another, one another's agencies if, in fact, you don't know each other that well. You need to think about, given what it is you want to do, how much central authority do you need? Now, there's a methodology for that um, in terms of how we figure that out. It's not just a random, I think this should be a merger, you think it should be a parent corporation, let's fight about it. There really is an assessment that we can do that uh, helps us understand kind of how much central authority we need. We make a choice of model. Um, the EDs may recommend that back to, their, to the individual boards so we get buy-in and acceptance. We do due diligence, which is about testing the fitness of our partners, um, develop an issues list, kind of what do we have to do to get from here from, from here to there, create some work sessions to address those issues, do an assessment of culture fit, how well are we going to work together, create an MOU to capture those decisions that's reviewed and approved by both boards. So if 
that's just kind of a quick overview of a process. There should be an attorney that prepares the final documents based on the MOU. The MOU is written in plain English. The attorney's conversion of those documents may not be. Um, schedule of board votes, signing party, you need to do communication planning, transition planning, and finally an integrated implementation plan to make sure that you can actually bring this, whatever it is you've invented or created, to fruition. Go ahead. So um, Forward Community Investments has a tool that we want to share with you called a readiness assessment, which I understand is either Dennis, is that going to be downloadable or yeah, we'll include it with the um, with a copy of the. Actually, we'll put it up on the website and provide a link to everyone that's come that has participated today. There'll be a recording of the session, the deck. I know a bunch of people have asked about copies of the handouts or pieces of the handout or the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, we'll make it available online as well as the readiness um, checklist that you're talking about, and also a link um, perhaps to the foundation centers um, and your website as well. Great. Any question? Is there a question there I can answer in the last minute or so, or? You know, there, there are, there's a, a few things here. One is, um, the question is, you know, is there a vacuum of leadership to look at real partnership to solve problems? And the comment that came with that is, um, or the anecdote, is that um, oftentimes we fail to see what we're truly trying to accomplish versus just meeting funder requirements and having a false sense that our particular organization is special or unique. Um, so do you have any comments around leadership and leadership to help um, support these types of collaborative models? Yeah, I mean, I always suggest the leadership go right back to the consumers. Um, in working with the War with 13, the most powerful thing they did was they did a series of focus groups and interviews, to, and they actually asked their clients to comment on the services that they receive, and that was just an incredible eye-opener in terms of really changing their view of what should happen. And also, they did some surveying of staff, and they saw some things in staff attitudes that they didn't really like. So building an information base that's, that's about the reality of the situations that you're working with can be a really good corrective to this notion that we are all wonderful and don't yeah, need to do this work. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple other um, leadership type connotations. Um, how do we go about letting other organizations know we're interested in some type of parent agency type of model? Getting that conversation going. Um, you can ask a funder to help do some convening. Um, if that seems like a politic thing to do, your community foundation, I've found community foundations to be really quite wonderful independent conveners. Um, but you can also simply have your board members reach out to their board members. Board president to board president is the right protocol. Um, just call them up, explore, say, kind of talk about what you're looking for, see if there's any interest. There's a question here, maybe a quick question around, um, in your experience, how many organizations um, are engaging with an attorney for collaborations that they've gotten involved with, that legal piece? Probably not enough. There should be attorney review of whatever you sign. Um, there, there needs to be built into it things like uh, conflict management language, um, you know, a cl careful delineation of what you are taking responsibility and what you're not taking responsibility for. Um, I, I will not facilitate anything in this space without attorney review. Great. Well, we are over the top of the hour, so I do want to thank Jane. I know we have a couple other questions that came in here. We'll try and get back to those individuals offline here just to respect everyone's time. But um, thank you, everyone, for participating. And please join me in thanking Jane for this um, excellent conversation around collaboration. Forward Community Investments is moving into um, this collaborative space. We will be launching some different programs next year um, around helping to educate nonprofits and communities across the state um, to explore and begin to have different types of conversations and really taking a, a different approach perhaps to root causes and, and really um, where collaboration fits into that. So look forward to that um, programming coming. Um, but again, I want to thank everyone. If you have questions, comments, feel free, please feel free to reach out to us at advisory services at forwardci.org. Um, you can also find us on our website at forwardci.org. Um, one last final note, when you close your browser from today's session, you are going to get a very quick um, questionnaire. I think it's five questions or so. It only takes a few minutes. Um, but it helps us um, continue to improve the effectiveness of these offerings. So our next session um, in the virtual leadership series is going to be on Tuesday, December 17th. Um, and we'll be closing down this year's um, series with a presentation from Akaya Winwood, 
um, talking about the leadership dialogue. And Akaya is with the Rockwood um, Leadership Institute in the Bay Area of California. So if you want to participate in that session, um, there will be a registration link coming up as a follow-up to this webinar today. So again, thanks to BMO Harris um, for supporting the work. Thanks to Jane and um, PO Partners for um, delivering today's presentation. And take care and enjoy the rest of your day.